Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a great lineup of some wines for you, um, and I can't wait to get you guys tasting. So before we get started, just a few things. Just a quick thank you to Davidson's, who is our local um, uh, partnership with our liquor store here. They're amazing, and they do so much for us. So just want to continuously give them all the thanks, um, and thank you for allowing us to go virtual with all of these during this crazy time, and thank you all for participating. Um, and then we would like to keep you guys muted throughout this just so the background noise isn't um, com conflicting with anything, if that's possible. So do try to keep yourself muted. And um, we encourage questions. Feel free to just write them in the chat and um, we'll check the chat throughout the time and we'll be able to answer those questions. And then if you do feel comfortable, please turn on your camera. It's a lot easier to talk to faces than it is to um, a black screen. So um, if you guys do feel comfortable, we encourage it, but you don't have to. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to both Shelly and Bo, and they're with Colt Paris Winery, and they will get us started. Awesome. Thank you guys for having us. Uh, everybody hear me all right? I guess there's no way to really know. I can see you. I can hear else. you. Okay, good. All right. Cool. Well, I, I uh, decided to start with the Canteris White as I sit out here on our smoky patio in Palisade, Colorado. Just over that hill right there, there's a big 120,000 acre fire that's uh, putting some smoke down into the valley, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but but that's the that's the life right now, I guess. So uh, just another thing to deal with in 2020, I suppose. But anyways, um, I'll, I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Bo Felton. I'm the head winemaker here at Cole Terrace. Cold Terrace, and um, we are 100% estate grown over in Palisade. We're about um, three and a half hours, four hours west of Denver over here by Grand Junction. We've got um, about 80 acres of grape vines that we tend to make all of our wines. So 100% of these wines we grow from our own vines and we, um, we produce them all right in the winery that's over on the other side of that wall right over there and um yeah this is where where all of these wines are born basically uh and, and i even have um some vines right here we can go take a quick look over at our cabernet sauvignon that um it's probably about three or four weeks maybe hopefully a little longer but uh everything's going a little going pretty quick here this year so we'll probably be uh harvesting these grapes uh middle of september or so but you can kind of see in there that we're um, mostly through verasion, which means uh, all the berries are pretty much uh, colored up. You can see a couple straggler green berries in there, but um, but yeah, all these wine, all these grapes right here around the winery uh, are Cabernet Sauvignon, and they'll be um, used to make our uh, 2020 Cabernet Sauvignon. So, um, anyways, uh, yeah, smoky, kind of unpleasant out here right now, to be completely honest with you, but. As soon as that highway is open, feel free to come over and join us <laughs> for a visit. Um, cool. And uh, joining me from Cold Terrace is our regional sales director, Shelly Bailey. And uh, she's over on the front range helping take care of uh, all of the liquor stores and uh, restaurants that take care of us, particularly Davidson's, which is um, our best account in the state of Colorado. So we're really happy to be able to participate in an event like this for Davidson's. And uh, we like to support them, obviously, because they do such a good job of supporting us. And what that really means is that all of you who are tuned in now go there and buy beer and wine and spirits from them. And, and ultimately, that allows me to come here every day and uh, make, make these wines. So um, without further ado, Shelly, you want to say something? You want to say hello? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Shelly. I, uh, as Bo said, the regional sales manager for Colteras. Um, just so thankful you guys are all here. This winery is amazing. The people who own it are fabulous. You guys are really in for a treat to taste all these wines that we have tonight. Um, I was up at the winery for the last five days. Smoke and all, we had ashes the size of snowflakes um, coming down while we were drinking wine. But um, Bo's fabulous. He He's modest, but he did start his winemaking life at Duckhorn Vineyards in Napa Valley. And uh, Scott and Teresa, the owners of the winery, have a vision to make world-class wines from Colorado. And they're accomplishing that. It's so exciting. We're getting accolades from all over the country, not just Colorado, 90-point um, ratings. The cans you're drinking tonight, 
Two of them have 90 point ratings. So I'm excited. Yeah, the white and the red got these great, great ratings. Um, the new vintages of bottles have not been rated yet because of COVID. It's not happening for some reason, but um, we're happy you're here. We love Davidson's. Thanks to Danielle, Rebecca, and Kristen for helping us put this event on. So um, you're going to love it. Enjoy. All right, cheers. Well, I guess the, uh, I didn't share. This is what I look like. I was on the <laughs> other side of the camera. Um, I've been canning a lot of wine. Uh, now that I look at myself on the camera, I maybe should have just kept it flipped the other way. So sorry about that. I'll I'll flip back to the to the pretty views. Um, <laughs> smoky but pretty. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, um, I saw Mike already has a question here about the um, vintage. One of the cans is vintage dated, and some of them aren't. Um, basically, ultimately, we decided uh, through the course of uh, over the last few years that we were going to drop the vintage date off. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we uh, screen print the cans now instead of having a shrink sleeve put on them. And uh, with getting them printed, we, we have to get uh, pretty large quantities of the cans made at a time and more than we really need for a single vintage. So we're able, we just dropped the vintage date off of them. But, um, but uh, really the intent behind the wine is, is the same. Um, the Canteris White here that I have actually in my hand is a blend of Chardonnay, Pinot Gris and Sauvignon Blanc. So we, we make um, a Chardonnay in bottle and we make a Sauvignon Blanc in bottle but Pinot Gris is a variety that um, we haven't yet made as a single varietal. It's only ever been used as a uh, part of our Canteris White. Uh, it's a really nice crisp wine. Uh, the, the Pinot Gris itself as well as, as a Sauvignon Blanc and the Chardonnay brings just a little bit more uh, flesh and a little bit more body to the to the Canteris White. But really with all these Canteris wines our intention is we want wines that are ready to drink, they're uh, easy to drink, they are not too complicated, but at the same time we still want it to be a premium wine product. And one of the things that we do that's uh, really important and really helps set us apart from some of the other wineries is that, um, or I should say some of the other canned options, is that we use a process where we put liquid nitrogen into the can. Uh, that helps preserve the freshness of the wine, but also um, helps give the can structure for the logistics of being able to ship the can around and not have them crush on each other and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that liquid nitrogen process allows us to make the wine and we don't have to put carbonation into the wine. So a lot of canned wine products out there are, um, are uh, carbonated and uh, this one doesn't happen to be hey there's a uh, here come the owners driving past right now they're gonna they're checking on me they're probably wondering what i'm doing out here drinking wine when i should be working but uh that's scott and Teresa. they're awesome um so yeah can't tear us white uh you know our, our what we always talk about our kind of our motto with these is that we want them to be um for going out on the canoe for taking camping for just the convenience of uh of being able to enjoy a premium wine product especially for the active Colorado lifestyle that we all like to live um, you know the overall yeah it's just a it's a really we get paid to uh, say can pun so it's a really convenient way way to enjoy a, a nice Colorado wine so I'll get my can pun out of the way for the for the evening there Shelly you have anything to add am I forgetting anything uh, no we'll just talk about the varietals for the um, other ones once once you move on to them so home. yeah we're good Awesome. Cool. Well, um, any, yeah, I don't know. They're just doing a drive-by. They just like to make, they just like to keep us honest here. Um, cool. So any other questions about the Canteris White? Uh, any questions about the property itself? Uh, I, I, the one other thing that I should mention actually is that our name Colteris. So COL for in Colteris is for Colorado and Terrace is a Latin phrase or Latin term that uh, means of the land or from the land. So that's really what we were going for. for so we're, we're really trying to make wines that are representative of the Colorado land that are from the Colorado land. So that's, as you can see right there on our can, that's our motto from the Colorado land. And that's one of the things that's really important to the owners, Scott and Teresa, that we only make wines from Colorado and particularly from our estate. So um, that will, if you buy Col uh, Canteris or Colteris, you know that 100% of those grapes are from Colorado and they always will be. And in fact, we actually um, have a little bit more fruit than we can even fit into the winery. So we actually um, end up selling some of our grapes to some of the other local wineries around here. So that's just um, 
you know, nothing. That's not really that major of a point. But but the 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 point is is that we're not ever going to buy bulk wine from California. We're not going to buy grapes from anybody else in the area. We're gonna we're gonna make them from our own property and from our own uh, uh, vineyards that we're able to tend and and make sure that um, they are cared for in the in a way that gives us the best possible grapes at every vintage. So um, that's really important to us. That's a one of our one of our main things is growing our own fruit. So cool. Well, and I think just on addition to that, because in Colorado, that's not that common for um, wineries to, to have 100% estate grapes. So great unique feature. Bo, I think you mentioned with the cans of liquid nitrogen, what happens is you don't get the effervescence. So the wine remains still as if it's from a bottle, which is awesome. That's how I like my wine. I want bubbles, I'm drinking champagne. And, um, there's no canned taste. Have you guys all opened your canned wine? Are you drinking the white right now? I hope so. Um, see what you're, how you're liking that. But um, one thing too with canned wine is a lot of wineries use kind of the wine that's not good enough to go in the bottles, but they don't want to waste it because it's not bad. So they make canned wine. But with Colteras, it's 100% estate. That wine from the cans could be in the bottles. So just a special note of another unique feature about the quality of our cans. Yes, yes. So we don't cut any corners with these wines when we pick them. We, we're, we're taking a lot of the same approach as we would if we were making a, a bottled wine. So it's uh, to Shelly's point, it's just, uh, just making wine the best way that we possibly can. And we just happen to use a different uh, packaging vessel than, than traditional. So. Normally you can see the Grand Mesa a little bit up there, but um, yeah, it's pretty smoky. Uh -huh. That's a corral right over there. We do trail rides down through the vineyards and along the river. So once I-70 opens back up, if any of you uh, hit and do a little trail ride down through the vines, that's an option, definitely. I saw a question about uh, where the wines are available. We are available uh, just within the state of Colorado, at least for distribution. But we do ship to selected states, and on Colteris.com you can uh, find out which state, which state those are that are that are uh, that we sell our wine to. So now I'm on the crush pad area. This is kind of be our hub of activity uh, during harvest. This is where we would do most of our um, harvest activity. We've got a big press over here. Um, we're going to start harvest on Monday. We'll pick our first grapes on Monday, Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, they'll go straight into that press right there, which will extract the juice, and then we'll put the juice over into one of our tanks and um, we'll start the uh, fermentation process. So come on inside here and hopefully it's not too noisy. Those are just cobwebs on the door there that I gave you a close up of, sorry about that. We actually just have been canning for the last um, few days. So what we've got over here is the tank full of Canteris Red that we're working on. The pump is disconnected right now, but uh, it would go through this sterile filter housing that's cleaning itself and then on, on over to the canning line over here where we'd actually fill up the cans, send them on down the line until they go over to the other side there and get put into a box and then eventually onto a pallet and to Davidson. So that's sort of been the definition of my life for the last three weeks. And um, uh, it's important because we needed to get it done anyways, but also with those grapes that are out there on the vines that are really close to being ready, uh, we need to we need to get some make some space in the winery. So. That's, uh, that's what we've been up to here in the last kind of push before we get into harvest. And then I'll, I'll step into the tasting room here real quick too, just to kind of give you a view of the, of the tasting room. Of course the lights are off because it's closed, but, um, but our socially distant space right now, come on in and we've got a whole lineup of 16 different wines that we, that we pour here as well. So I think that'll maybe be the end of the winery tour portion and I'll kind of pop up to my desk and we can keep tasting some wines. Shelly, you want to maybe introduce uh, the Sauvignon Blanc as I make my way up there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm not really sure if all of you guys on the, on the call have actually um, have all five wines that we're tasting tonight, but we are going to do so to the white can. We're going to do the Sauvignon Blanc next. And the Sauvignon Blanc is one of my favorites. As Bo always says, we're selling a whole bunch of it all over the front range since I took over. So um, it's delicious. Very surprising coming out of Colorado. You would not know it's from Colorado. 100% uh, Sauvignon. And then we're going to go on to the 
rose can or maybe the coral white cab. I'm not sure which order we're going to do um, on that one. And then we'll finish with the red can. So um, one thing about the liquid nitrogen, just to note while we're waiting for bow again, is the shelf life is forever on that, where when you have CO2 in the cans, they expire like beer expires. So um, lots of great features that, that the winery takes into consideration when they're producing a product. Um, Scott and Teresa do everything completely high end. If Bo wants French barrels, he has these specific ones he wants from France. They're like $1,500 each. So whatever Bo wants, he gets. And um, we have Italian winemaking equipment. It's just really a very special, um, it's a very special winery, very special family. And as you can tell, Bo is so humble and so brilliant and so talented. So if you guys want to open your Sauv Blanc and uh, I'm here. start to pour some of that. I got to hear that nice flattery there, Shelly. Oh, I thought you were on mute, Bo, <laughs> or I thought you couldn't hear anything. Oh, no, I heard all of it. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> now I'm blushing. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to have a hard time getting my head back outside of my office door here because it's growing, but that's kind of like... <laughs> all true, all true. Um, so, yeah, anyways, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, the 2018 vintage. So, you know, one of the things that I think is really important uh, about what we're trying to do here is that a lot of uh, kind of wine snobby people, if you will, or, or um, critics and stuff, they always talk about this notion of, of varietal typicity. So making a wine that tastes like it's supposed to taste in essence. So that's one of the things that we really work hard on is making sure that when we make a Sauvignon Blanc that it, it invokes thoughts of previous Sauvignon Blancs that you've had, be it from uh, Calistoga area in the Napa Valley or be it from, uh, from New Zealand, you know, obviously it has a strong uh, Sauvignon Blanc game. So we want it to be like Sauvignon Blanc, but we want it to be expressive of our terroir and of our climate over here that we've got in Western Colorado. So um, that's one of the things that's really important. We want to make sure that the wines, you know, we don't want this to like be super sweet uh, and lack acid because that's not what Sauvignon Blanc is. Sauvignon Blanc is a light, crisp wine. It's about the acidity. It's got a nice acid backbone to it. Uh, it's easy to drink, but also this wine can be pretty versatile. It can pair up nicely with charcuterie plates. It can pair up with lighter pasta dishes and, and seafood dishes. Um, I, I think it's really, it, it's, it's, it's a great wine. I love uh, acid-driven white wines. So for me personally, this is a, a particularly nice wine, especially when we start getting into the dog days of summer and it, it gets a little hot for um, some of our traditional big red wines. It's nice to kind of dip into something that's a little bit more uh, refreshing and a little bit more crisp. So um, Sauvignon Blanc, you know, I know that this is a virtual tasting. You guys probably want me to like say like, oh, uh, citrus and flower petals and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I'm a firm believer that um, each one of us have had a lot of different experiences in our lives that have um, helped us formulate uh, our palates and our uh, what kind of smells invoke what thoughts about certain flavors. So I, I always hate to do that because it... Um, the power of suggestion is strong and, and if uh, I, I'd like you all to kind of be able to formulate your own opinion about it. So that's really what I uh, my, kind of my two cents of why I'm not going to sit here and t uh, say every flavor that you should smell or taste in this wine because I just um, I, I don't know. I mean for me personally I, I, I think it's got some nice tropical fruit notes. I think it's got some nice uh, floral character particularly like a citrus blossom note to it. Um, those are the things that I like about the wine. And again, you know, the, the recurring theme in all of these wines is acidity. I love acidity in wine. I think it's a really, really important thing. And it's kind of tricky in the hotter climate. We tend to drop acidity out of the, the grapes, lose their acidity naturally on the vine. So we got to try and pick them before they, they get to that point where they lose their natural acidity. So Sauvignon Blanc is an example where it's particularly tart because it's uh, supposed to be that way. But throughout the this the, our lineup of wines, acidity is something that I'm thinking about all the time. I think that uh, acid backbone of a wine, even on big red wines, is um, something that is really important with for the way that they taste, for the way that they pair with foods. And uh, if we lose that acidity, then the wines can start to hit sit heavy and flat, and uh, they don't have the vibrancy that they need to um, keep the palate interested and, and awake, basically. So. Um, acidity is a recurring theme, but I think Sauvignon Blanc is kind of the epitome of that, of that notion of um, 
of a wine that's uh, about acidity. It's about the tartness in this wine. It's about how crisp it is. And that crispness can really help cut through some of the, like we're talking about some of the pasta sauces or some of those cheeses on a charcuterie pit, a plate like that. So uh, yeah, real good, nice and easy to drink. Uh, any questions about the Sauvignon Blanc? Should we keep rolling on? I'll just keep drinking this, but I'll talk about the other wines. Ooh, it tastes like peach rings. Oh, good. Yum. Um, I know, it's delicious. Sorry, I can't be humble right now, I guess. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next two wines that we've got are um, Coral and Canteras Rosé. Um, these are pretty interesting wines. So. I don't happen to have the coral sitting with me. I've got the Canteras Rosé right here. But um, the, the wines are really made together in, in essence. As I walked into the winery, I, I stopped briefly at our press where we uh, liberate all the juice from the grapes. And um, coral and the Canteras Rosé are basically made at the same time. In essence, we, we fill up the press with grapes and all of the juice that's coming out of the press as we're filling it up, we put into the coral tank. And what we kind of refer to that is uh, free run juice. So in that free run, we, uh, we capture that free run for coral. So it's the most delicate juice. It's uh, really pure and clean. It's got almost no color to it, as you can kind of see uh, while that wine's in the glass. It's very light in color, even though it's made from Cabernet Sauvignon grapes, not unlike the same, it's the same grapes that we would use to make a big full color Cabernet Sauvignon we just pick it a little bit earlier. So that's, an, that's another important notion where we make our rosés with intention. We pick them um, about three weeks or so earlier than we would pick the grapes for our full color wines. So in this case, it's Cabernet Sauvignon. We'll go back into that same vineyard and we'll pick a few weeks later and we'll make a big full bodied Cabernet Sauvignon. But if we bring those grapes into the winery right away and we extract the juice right away and we limit the skin contact, we end up with a couple beautiful rosés. And um, I started to talk about how coral is basically the free run. And then as soon as we turn on that press to extract the rest of the juice out of those grapes, we switch the hose over to our Canteras tank. So they, it's really a nice complementary process where we're able to capture the beautiful essence of coral. And um, we pick up just a little bit more color as we go through the pressing process. So um, that, uh, having a little bit darker hue in the Canteras rosé isn't necessarily as big of a concern, obviously, because it's behind a piece of aluminum. So it's not something that, um, you know, visually uh, is, is as important. Of course, we still want it to be a nice rosé color, but we don't, um, we don't have to put as much emphasis on it because you can't see through the container uh, like you can on the bottle of rosé. So um, those wines really, they, they're, they're, um, they, come, they come at the same time, they're born together. And uh, really it's the two most similar wines that we have between a bottle and a can. Uh, and that's uh, always kind of an interesting thing to sort of taste the difference between those two wines and uh, see how they, they are a little bit different. Uh, you know, obviously the process makes them a little bit different, but also the, the container itself makes them a little bit different. So a lot of times we'll have people come into the uh, tasting room and they ask, well, do you have a wine that you make that you put in bottles and cans? And while we don't have two, the exact same wine in a bottle and in a can, these two are the closest. So I usually will kind of pour those if uh, people are kind of curious and, and want to see how the packaging can actually um, change the presentation of the wine itself. So, Well, Bo, hey, just a real quick thought. I'm thinking if people do both have the Coro and the Rosé right now, pour the Rosé can into a glass. I think it'd be kind of fun for them to compare the color and the taste, do it side by side instead of you know, one at a time for those that have it. Yeah. It's kind of fun to compare. Isn't the residual sugar slightly different from the yeah, can? Yeah, there's just a little bit more residual sugar in the coral than in the can. We ferment a little bit more sugar out of the can. Um, although I've been getting some feedback that I think the market likes it a little bit more coral sweet. So we'll probably, probably bump the residual sugar in the can just slightly. But um not too much because I don't really like them when they get too sweet. So I, I want to drink. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, Shelly's actually talking about a really important point there. We, um, we do arrest the fermentation and uh, when we arrest the fermentation, 
that um, maintains just a little bit of the natural sugar that um, that's present. And um, maintaining a little bit of that natural sugar uh, is important because there's so much natural acidity in these wines as well that we kind of need to find that balance point. And um, it can be a little, uh, these wines can be a little hard. They can be a little tart uh, without that touch of residual sugar. So um, on both the Coral and the Canteris Rosé, that touch of residual sugar, while it doesn't necessarily come off as being super sweet, uh, unless you're really sensitive to sugar, uh, it's really, really important in the way that that wine sits on your palate and the way that the acidity is balanced uh, within the, with, on the, in the context of that wine on your palate. So um, yeah, not too nerdy, still good? Okay, good. Uh, cool, any more questions about those two? You want me to just keep rolling right on? I guess we're on to the Pinterest Red. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I've got like I can see a handful of, of screens of the people that are participating. I can see at least four pets right now. I think, which is awesome. I love that. <laughs> I wish I had a pet with me right now. I'm just stuck in a winery <laughs> office. But whatever. Uh, got wine, so that that's I'll settle for that. Um, I don't think I really said anything about Davidson's. Maybe I'll circle back before I forget to do that. But Davidson's is our most uh, is our our best account in the state of Colorado. I think I did say this actually. Now that I'm saying it again, but um, so thanks again, all of you, for uh, supporting us by supporting Davidson's. And um, yeah, we really we like those guys. And I actually got to do one of their late night uh, TV commercials last year. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen that on TV, but. Um, I just wanted to be on the record that that was in one take, once a single take. So, uh, <laughs> no? <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, it's at weird times in the night that it plays. So nobody, I, I haven't gained any notoriety because of the Davidson's commercial yet. But um, I'll wait. Um, cool. Well, now I'm talking about stuff that really isn't pertinent to wine. But um, well, I was going we to say, I was going to say that receiver just real quick too, um, Bo about Danielle. She's from the Highlands Ranch Community Association. She's the one who had the initial screen up for you guys. She's been one of the behind the scenes coordinators of this whole event. She partners with Davidson's to put on these great events, make sure Bo and I have the agenda, we know what we're doing, the coloring's right. She's, she's really fabulous. So I don't wanna leave her out as we're thanking Davidson as well. So just a little side note there. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry Danielle, I didn't mean to snub you there, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so the Canteris Red. So uh, I mentioned on the Canteris White that we have we grow Pinot Gris, and the only place that the Pinot Gris in our, shows up in our portfolio outside of a kind of special winery-only late harvest wine is in the can. And in the red spectrum, we grow Syrah, and the only place that the Syrah shows up is in the can as well. Um, a big part of that is because we're predominantly trying to drive uh, – our, our red wine portfolio is driven, at least in bottle, is driven by Bordeaux varietals. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Those are our five main uh, red varietals that we're working on with our bottled projects. And we make a blended red wine from the five of those as well. That's pretty special and I like a lot, but I won't talk about it because we're not tasting. You'll just have to go and find Colorado out of uh, Davidson's. But um, I will talk about the can because that's actually our other red blend. So Colorado is a red, a red blend. Um, the Canteris Red is a red blend. And uh, <laughs> all right, Mark, I'm going to talk about it. It's awesome. Go get Colorado. It's the best. Um, it is the best. The 18 is amazing. Sorry. The 18 Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Vicky, I see that. That's what I'm talking about. Um, but the Canteris is actually, Canteris Red is actually really cool too because of the fact that when we're able to make blends, so if it's Colorado or if it's a Canteris Red, we're able to key on strengths of all these different wines. So we're able to key on the nice fruitful roundness of the Malbec. We're able to draw, draw in some of that body and heft from the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Merlot is actually pretty big and intense here in Colorado as well. Uh, the Petit Verdot has got a, while it's got nice tannins, it's also got a really juicy mid palate to it. And being able to kind of bring all those pieces together in a blend really is a winemaker's dream. When, we, when we're working with a single varietal, uh, sometimes there are weaknesses within that varietal that we, we can't necessarily address because we are trying to make a Cabernet Sauvignon. So when we have the ability to make a blended wine, uh, it really, really helps us. Uh, it's a really nice winemaking tool. So 
in that regard, the Canteras Red, I, it's, I always kind of chuckle because I taste it. When I taste it, I just think, man, this is like, and I, I mean, I, I honestly believe it. It's too good for a can. It's almost too good for a can. It's just uh, the blend of the wine that's in there, the quality of the wine that's in there. Um, it, it's, it, it just is, it's so good. And it's got it's a lot of complexity. It's got layers because of the fact that we're able to use all those different varietals. And I think that that's um, one of the things that uh, really sets our, our Canteras Red apart from some of the other canned red products that are out there. And again, I think, you know, the point that we were making earlier can't be um, repeated enough that even though the Syrah is a wine that only is going to go into our Canteras Red. Much to my any... dismay. Just saying. I know, I know. <laughs> well, stand by. We might be able to do something about that. Um, but, but the the important the more important thing is is that just because it's going into a can it doesn't change our approach in the winery we still try to make an ideal pick call on that wine we still age it in french oak and, and a small amount, amount of Mer american oak barrels we basically go through the exact same steps that we were going to go through if we were going to make a red our best red wine our colorado you know if we we're going to bottle it and put it into a bottle we still go through the same process and we still take the same care and attention for each of the wines that ends up in, in the Canteras. And I, that's a really important thing because as Shelly kind of alluded to earlier, there are a lot of wineries who will kind of just take uh, the dregs, whatever's left over, they'll filter it up, they'll throw some sugar at it, they'll force carbonation into it and then they'll put it into a can and put it on the shelf and sell it for $3 a can. And uh, people think they're getting something really good, but in reality it's, it's not that great. Um, it might be, it might taste okay, but it's, but the intention that went into it is um, probably not there. Um, so I, that's one of the things that I think is really important about our canned wines. When Scott and Teresa, quite frankly, when Scott and Teresa originally proposed the can products, I was a little skeptical. I didn't think it was the best idea. Um, but then as we went down the down the route a little bit more and I got to see the, the package design. I got to see what the cans were actually going to look like. Uh, I got to, I obviously had a front row seat of what the, what the wine tasted like and what the wine was going to be like in the end. And um, uh, uh, ultimately I think it was a really good decision. Uh, it's, it's opened up a new market for us and it's a uh, kind of um, uh, just a, it's a really fun wine. It gives a, people a, another way to enjoy Colorado wine and, uh, we're just trying to knock down the level of pretension in the wine industry in general. So our, our bottles are all under screw cap. We make some wine in a can. And um, there are people that come here who uh, ask about, you know, they, they start to kind of have a little bit of heartache about, about the um, screw caps that we're using. So then we like to pour them the can terrace underneath the bar and then pull it up and say, hey, try this one. And then they're like, oh, that's great. That's great. And it's like, well, it's out of an aluminum can. So don't worry about the screw cap that we're using <laughs> to finish our bottle of wine. Um, well, and, so. you know, Bo, the screw cap just mentioned is the Selvin, which is, it can breathe like a cork. So it's a high end, like everything Scott and Teresa do, top of the line Porsche Carrera of screw caps. They're individually calibrated. So they breathe like a cork. So you can lay the wine down and age it or drink it now. So Another super unique feature about that kill terrace. <laughs> yes, that's true. So, um, anyways, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't, uh, I can talk more about flavors and aromas and that kind of stuff. But you guys have got it in front of you, and you can taste it and smell it. And I'm sure uh, if if anybody really wants me to say that stuff, there's a chat section. We can do that. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it get, like this, the most important thing for our cans is that. We want them to be. We want them to be just accessible. We want people to be able to go and enjoy them wherever they are, um, without pretension. You know, I say that a bunch. One of the things that we talked about the most is that you know originally we're like, yeah, camping in the backpack, on the trail, in the canoe, all that stuff. I, I hear a lot more and more from people who, um, you know, well, my husband or my spouse doesn't really like to drink wine as much as I do, and. It's the, there's a convenience to a smaller increment, you know, for a Tuesday night. Some of us don't mind drinking the whole bottle on a Tuesday. Some of us do. <laughs> uh, so that's always a nice thing. 
I it, usually when people when I'm like, yeah, if you don't want to drink a whole bottle on a Tuesday, this is not you know the can's nice, and then they're like, well, I don't mind, and it's like, well, if you don't want to open the second bottle, you can have a can after the first bottle. So there's a couple different ways that you can make the can product work in your life. And uh, I think it has a lot of uh, applic uh, applicability. It's applicable to a lot of people. I hear it, it goes great in golf bags. Um, and I've also heard that it's small enough that you can get it onto a chairlift too if we're allowed to go skiing this winter. Uh, I'm not sure. How <laughs> that, but, um, so yeah, anyways, guys, I just, uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say about the wines, but uh, just to reiterate, we're 100% Colorado grown. We always will be, we, we use the term estate. Um, sometimes people misunderstand and they think I'm saying a state, like the state of Colorado, but estate, like a like a like an estate where we grow all of our grapes and manage all of the process. And uh, we have, we can't let the fruit basically off of the property for any reason, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but in California, there are a lot of places where they'll buy grapes and then they'll ship them to, you know, a winery to have the wine grapes processed over there. And then they'll eventually bring them into their facility and they'll blend them up and, and make wine and sell it to all of us. And not to say that, that there's anything wrong with that, but I just like to uh, drive home that point that there's a, a authenticity to Colteris that um, that doesn't exist at, the, at that price point, quite frankly, if you go into the store and you look at that $24, $25 price point from the West Coast, you're not gonna find anything that's uh, estate grown. You're not gonna find anything that's 100% controlled by those West Coast wineries at that price point. So um, it's it's always notable to think that, you know, if we were to take Col Terrace and plop it down in California or Washington or something, our, our bottle price would probably triple overnight. Um, and that's one of the benefits of uh, to you guys of us being in Colorado where we're still working on establishing that identity um, to of, of what Colorado wines can be so that's a really important thing for all of us to uh, at least uh, within the within the Col Terrace family is that we're really trying to drive that perception of Colorado wines upward even even if it's in a canned wine we still want those wines to over deliver we want people to be really really proud of those wines uh, be able to share them with their friends when they come into town and um, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's really the essence of what we're trying to do here. If it's in a bottle or in a can, we want, that, we want the wine to continue to push that notion of w what Colorado wine can be uh, higher. We want people to really consider us in the conversation of uh, great wines of the world. And uh, considering that we're all within the same great state, um, we just are thankful for y'all support and, and uh, looking forward to continuing to uh, make great wines for everybody to enjoy. I see a couple questions here popped in. Uh, any plans to expand the Canteris line? Actually, Canter making Canteris is one of the, um, oh, maybe I shouldn't go here, Shelly. Stop me. I know. It's terrible. I hate it. No, I we're can't. not making it anymore. No more Canteris. I know. We're going to cancel it. I can show the video I took yesterday when I was there. No, it's great. <laughs> uh, no plans at the moment to, um, sorry, Rebecca. No, it, we're not, no plans to um, expand it right at the moment. Uh, I always have the desire to have something with effervescence, but um, yeah. there's, it might not end up in a can. That's a sampling sparkling wine Yeah, bottle. no can, please. <laughs> um, uh, Colorado versus Monumental. Monumental is a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon that we make um, in, with the Colorado National Monument Association. We donate money back to them uh, to support their efforts over at the Colorado National Monument, which is basically a national park worthy monument over here near Grand Junction. It's absolutely stunning. It's super beautiful. They've got a really cool, um, really cool amphitheater over there that uh, the money from Monumental is particularly uh, going to support that, um, that amphitheater project that they've got going on over at the monument. And the versus Colorado, which is the uh, Bordeaux style red blend. So we incorporate all five of the, of the red varietals that, of the B noble Bordeaux varietals that we grow here, which I mentioned earlier, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Merlot, and Malbec. That's a blend of the five. So Monumental is 100% Cab Sauv, Colorado is a blend. Um, Shelly, is Monumental over there? Nope, it's only available at the winery. Okay, that's kind of what I thought, so. Yeah. You'll have to go or the wine, like the wine club. I think the wine club can get it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, the wine club gets it, I think, too. 
I have oh, some in my cellar just because I bought it. Before I, I think we can ship it. it. We can ship it over there too if need be. But uh, uh, yeah. and last, uh, I see uh, Danielle. Yeah, the um, smoke is happening over here, and there's a thing called in the wine world called smoke paint, um, and it's not really that cool. <laughs> and we're kind of pretending like it's not going to be a thing this year. But it's 2020, so, you know, what the hell? Why not? <laughs> we'll just take another beating this year, and just hopefully we'll get them all out of our system for a decade or so. But, yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. The, the smoke that is sitting on the vines right now um, and has been um, the vines as they go through their um, – physiology, the physiological processes of ripening and respiration and all that stuff, they'll actually take up some of that smoky air and their chemicals in that air that will eventually reveal themselves when we go through the, the um, fermentation process. So the hope right now is that it appear, if it is present, that it shows up as um, a free barrel flavor. Like, oh, it's a little smoky. It's got a little <laughs> nice, it's a nice barrel note. Um, but the reality is, is that um, I'm not very excited about the smoke and um, I've been kind of dusting up my protocol, dusting off my protocols of how we're going to deal with fruit that um, potentially is affected by the smoke. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not, it's, it's just, it's, it's 2020 in a nutshell, I guess. I don't know what else to say about it. Just, um, it sucks frankly. <laughs> well, you guys, anybody else have any questions? Any, any other, we, we make, I didn't even go into it. We make a whole bunch of bottled wines beyond the Sauvignon Blanc and Coral. We have a, a Merlot, we have a Cabernet Sauvignon, we have a Cabernet Franc, we have a Malbec, we have a Petit Verdot. The Petit Verdot is pretty awesome. One of my favorite reds that we make. The Colorado, I, I touched on a little bit. Um, all these wines are available at Davidson's. Um, all of the wines are available here at the tasting room. We make a couple extra wines that are, are, are specifically available to wine club members or um, if you come to the tasting room. So obviously um, you, you're all invited. Uh, don't mind that fire on I-70. That one, you can just go right around that one. Uh, Let's take the eight hour detour. <laughs> yeah, it's like an eight hour detour. It's not that big of a deal. And then the nice thing is that you'll have a bunch of wine in the back of the car on the way home. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Just grabbing at straws here. Like anything we can do to kind of make, make it seem like uh, <laughs> you can still get here. And <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, I appreciate, again, I appreciate uh, you guys for uh, supporting us. And um, I, I, I'm the first one to acknowledge that if people didn't actually like to drink wine and um, purchase it and consume it, that there would be really no reason for me to show up here every single day. So thank all of you from the bottom of my heart because I like to come to work. I like to make wine. I think this is a really cool process that I get to be a part of. It's really fun. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it. It's not the easiest thing. There's a lot of potential pitfalls. We've kind of touched on a few of them even in the, in the half an hour or whatever that we've been together. Um, but we, we work hard to try and uh, Put the best product that we can out there for, for everybody and we're super proud of making Colorado wines and we want all of you as um, our brethren of the state to uh, be proud of what we're doing as well and uh, share it and support it and uh, you know when, when you're in those places that tout farm to table make sure that you rib them a little bit when they have a bunch of California wines on the list because uh, that doesn't really count as farm to table if you ask me so. Right. <laughs> Yes, Rebecca, I see one last comment here that yes, a lot of the wine, everything that I'm talking about basically that isn't featured in the tasting is available at Davidson's, just to reiterate that. So uh, Davidson's has our whole lineup of wines. There's a, there's a bunch of really fun wines to, to try and um, I would encourage everybody to drink, drink them and then drink them again and then drink them one more time at least. You know, it's also, um, Davidson's carries, we have a single vineyard Riverside Cab, which is very limited production. Not very many stores got it because we did. We just selected the stores who could get it. They just brought in a case uh, for this event because we knew you would all love it. Uh, it's it's fabulous. The price point's a bit higher. It's worth the price point. Um, once it's gone, it's gone. We have like two cases left in the warehouse. So uh, really special wine that Bo made. And I think 
Rebecca, you can correct me, but Davidson's is doing a 10% off or some sort of discount of all of our wines for the next two weeks. So load up for the holidays. Our wines are amazing for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, they're just gorgeous. So we're glad you guys were here. And like I said, Davidson's has every single wine we carry they have. So it's awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, if we don't have any other questions, then I will just go ahead and close it up. Um, I just want to have a huge thank you to Bo and a huge thank you to Shelly. This was amazing. It was very cool to see the winery and thanks for walking us through all the wines. It was amazing. So um, thank you so much. And then uh, like we've said multiple times tonight, thanks to Rebecca and thanks to Davidson's. Go get yourself some wine and um, what, if you like the ones you tasted tonight or go try some different ones or both. Um, but uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it and we hope to see you guys back in two weeks. Our next tasting will be um, pumpkin beers and Oktoberfest beers to get you guys in the mood for uh, fall, which is crazy, like crazy that's right around the corner, but it's almost here. <laughs> so um, that'll be our, um, in two weeks, that's going to be our next one. So check that out. And thanks again, Bo, and thanks, Shelly. We appreciate you guys being here. Have a great rest of your guys' night. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, my boys. My children are on the call. I'm so happy. Hi. <laughs> Say hi to my boys. They live in different states. So glad they're here. <laughs>